Very good to see you all today. The title of the lesson this morning is The End. And we begin studying the end over in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 7. Ezekiel, chapter 7. In Ezekiel 7, we're going to read here the first nine verses and see that the kingdom of Judah came to an abrupt, violent, and painful end. Ezekiel 7, verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, An end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a singular disaster. Behold, it has come. An end has come, the end has come. It is dawn for you, behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land. The time has come, a day of trouble is near, and not of rejoicing in the mountains. Now upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. Of course, the people of the land, and it mentions Israel here at the beginning, but Ezekiel was specifically prophesying to those who were in the southern kingdom of Judah, and they were astonished. They could not believe that Jehovah God would come against them in this way in judgment. They took for granted that Jehovah had delivered them out of the land of Egypt, had settled them in this land of Canaan, that he had revealed his law. Their idea was we're his chosen people. We're always going to be in his favor. But he is telling them very plainly and very clearly that their nation, their time was coming to an end. And that truly has happened to all nations that have ever existed, whether it was Egypt, Greece, Rome. All these nations have risen. All these nations have fallen. And individuals within those nations, of course, have met their end as well. Now, while there are some things that we cannot control, there are some things that we cannot predict, we do have something to say or we do have some influence over what our ultimate end is going to be. Our ultimate end could be violent and painful and filled with fear or it could be something that is very peaceful, very pleasant, something in which we rejoice. It can be a great and wonderful blessing for us. In studying the end, we want to examine that there is an end that will come, there is an end that should come, and there is an end that will never come. So first of all, there is an end that will come. As we see here in Ezekiel chapter 7, if you also want to go over to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, again, the nation of Judah came to an end. The nation of Judah, remember the southern kingdom after the northern and southern kingdom split for one another. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we see that though they had a past of kings that were faithful to God, but then some kings that were unfaithful to God, God has reached the end of his long suffering. And he is not going to tolerate this nation anymore that has lived in rebellion toward him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, 
and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. So there was an end of God's patience with his people, of working with them, of trying to get them to turn around. As it said there, sending the messenger, sending the prophets, to call them back to the Lord, to call them to humble themselves, and to restore that relationship by submitting to his will. But they were stubborn, they were hard-hearted. They loved the ways of the world, and so they turned away from those prophets. They mocked those prophets. They rejected the message that was given. And so at some point, God decided, I'm finished. And as he said here, there's no remedy. There's no changing it. There's nothing you can do now because the nation will come to an end. You remember a similar type of event that happened many centuries before that all the way back in Genesis chapter 6, where God had lost His patience with all of mankind. In Genesis chapter 6, remember in verse 3, it says that the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. If you jump down to verse 13, Genesis 6, 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Ancient man, after committing sin, falling into sin with Adam and Eve, and then with Cain, and the descendants that came after Cain, and how that sin continued to spread among mankind, and it got to the point where the Lord said, I'm bringing an end to this. Only Noah and his family survived that judgment. All others were destroyed in that flood. All others who had walked on this earth perished in the great flood because God's long-suffering, God's patience came to an end. We recognize that this is going to happen with all of creation. If you go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 3, he actually references back to the flood and talking about how that God had judged the entire world before, destroyed all living beings on the earth. And that that points to the fact that there's going to be another judgment. In 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 7, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord... One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is waiting and longing for us to turn to Him. He has sent messengers to us, if you will. He sent the apostles and prophets. He has revealed His will for us. He has preserved it down to this day so that we can read it, we can know it, we can understand it, just as He did with ancient Judah, sending the message to the people to repent, to submit to Him, to restore that relationship with Him. So God is long-suffering, but 2 Peter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. There's an end coming to all creation. And as he notes here, it's going to happen like a thief in the night. In other words, we don't know when it's going to occur. It's going to be all of a sudden. It's going to be unexpected. We can't predict it. We can't say it's going to be in a certain day, certain month, or a certain year. It's going to be a surprise. But he says here, the heavens will pass away. All these things will be burned up. And we will stand before God in the judgment. And let us understand that as he describes the judgment here, as we read about it with the ancient man in Genesis chapter 6 in the flood, as we discussed 
in talking about Judah and bringing that nation down, God's judgment against the wicked is brutal and without mercy. No one will survive it. No one will resist it. Our life on earth will come to an end. God's long suffering will come to an end. And we are, may or may not be alive when that occurs. But we will come to an end. As long as this world stands, we're going to reach a point in time when we will pass from this life. In Psalm 89, Psalm 89, notice how the psalmist puts it here. In Psalm 89 and verse 48. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? We can't do it. It's amazing how there have been people through time that have tried to avoid death. They've thought there's some secret thing that they could do that would allow them to be exempt from death. There's the fabled fountain of youth. It doesn't exist. There are people who, in modern times, very wealthy people who have spent untold amounts of money in trying to cheat death, eating the right things, exercising the right way, getting the right medicines, the treatments, having doctors tell them this or the other, or even going to particular gurus and cult-type leaders. Well, how can I avoid death? There have been those that have paid who knows how much money to preserve their brains cryogenically. They've frozen their brains, and they think, well, scientists one day will figure out how to bring me back to life. And it's all utterly futile. Because there is no man that will not see death. There is no man that will be able to resist or to deliver his life from the power of the grave. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Hebrews 9 verse 27. The Hebrew writer says this. And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. We are all going to die. Except if the Lord comes first, we understand. But we are all headed to the grave. It is unavoidable. We're headed to the end, if you will. And there is a finality to that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the wise man here, in fact, throughout this entire book, is really pointing toward the idea of what is the value of your life? You live your whole life and, and where's the value? Where's the benefit? Where's the good in this life? Where is true peace, contentment, and happiness, fulfillment? Where is that found? And he ends the book by talking about the fact that it's only found when we fear God and keep His commandments. But notice Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2 where, it's better to, where he says this, better to go to the house of of mourning then to the house of feasting for that is the end of all men and the living will take it to heart that's the end the finality now there's going to be a resurrection but as far as life on this earth as we have known it since we've been born to this day that's over and it will never be experienced again we go to that house of mourning that of all men that is the place to which we are all headed there is an end that will come to all the universe and to us individually in this world before the universe comes to an end now there is an end that should come there's an end that should come there's an end that needs to come to sin in our life remember in John chapter 8 John 8 there was a woman brought to Jesus who had been caught in the act of adultery. And we won't go into all the details of what's happening here, but I want us to notice what Jesus says to this woman 
who is caught in the act of adultery. In John 8, verse 11, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In the context, when he says, I do not condemn you, he's not saying you haven't sinned because he just follows that up and says, Go and sin no more. What he's saying is, under the law, he could not accuse her of adultery and have her stoned to death. That's the context of what's going on. But the key we want to get out of this is that he sin no more. That's the same thing the Lord would tell us. If he came to us and we had lived in sin, we had committed sin, he would say, go and sin no more. We need to bring an end to sin in our life. If you go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Remember that the apostle is writing to Christians here. And he says in Romans 13, verse 11, And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The apostle is pointing out that your life is coming to an end. The day of salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He's pointing to the fact that time is passing by and the Lord is coming back. And because of that, because that time is passing and we are going to stand before him in judgment, he says, cast off those works of darkness. And then he lists several of those. He talks about revelry. That's the idea of being half drunk. It's like a college party. He talks about drunkenness. That's the intoxication, like the drunk, somebody who's addicted to the alcohol. He talks about lewdness. In the King James, it's translated as chambering. It's translated that way because it's talking about illicit sexual intercourse, going into chambers and committing fornication. He mentions lust here, that you have to cast off lust. It means unbridled lust, excess, shamelessness, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. It says to cast off strife, the contention, the wrangling, to get rid of envy, the contentious rivalry and jealousy that exist. You have to bring an end to this in your life. Put it to death. Get rid of it. Cast it off. In Ephesians 4, he talks about putting on the new man. And we put on that new man by renewing the mind. In Hebrews chapter 11, he mentions this. Hebrews 11, the Holy Spirit reveals that when we leave sin and we commit our life to the Lord, we are not to look back. In Hebrews 11, verse 13, he says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. So those ancient men and women of faith, when they heard the word of God and they listened to God's commands and they decided they were going to serve God, He says they didn't look back. They didn't look to where they came from. They didn't turn around and say, well, I really miss those things. We know the children of Israel did that. The children of Israel missed the food that they had to eat in Egypt. They forgot about that slavery, that pain, that suffering they were going through. But the men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, he says they didn't look back. When they committed themselves, they kept going forward. They kept pressing on and serving God and doing His will. And that's what we need to do. An end, needs to, uh, an end needs to come to sin in our life 
And we don't need to look back at those days with fondness and missing them and longing for them any longer. But that we keep our hearts and minds focused on heaven, serving God and doing His will. And an end needs to come to our indecision. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18, you remember Elijah and how that he had announced there would be a drought in the land because of the sins that were being committed from Ahab, Jezebel, on down through the nation. And there was a drought for three and a half years and then Elijah appears again and he confronts Ahab, he confronts the people and he tells them this in 1 Kings 18, verse 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. But the people answered him, not a word. You know, there are people who will look and see, well, the Bible is the truth. There is a God. And Jesus is the Savior. But I also see the world out here. And I kind of like the world, and I kind of like what Jesus is saying, and I kind of want to do both. Elijah's calling on the people here as they looked at Jehovah God, as they looked at Baal, as they kind of wanted to have a little of each of them. He says, how long will you falter between two opinions? In other words, make up your mind and do what is right. We have to get rid of indecision. We have to make that choice. Are we going to serve God? Or are we going to serve mammon? In Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 6 verse 24, Jesus puts it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the things of this world. You can't serve God and Satan. We have to make a decision. And when we make that decision, be steadfast and strong. As the Corinthians were admonished in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. The apostle says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In verse 13 of the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let's be resolved to serve God. Not faltering between two opinions, not trying to divide ourselves between the Lord and His kingdom and the world that we're going to serve the Lord all the days of our lives and look forward to that home that He promises us in the end. Now let's look for a moment or two on something that will never come to an end or things that will never come to an end. First of all, the love of God won't come to an end. In 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Let's notice verse 16 here. Says we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. God is love. And because he is love, we understand love will never come to an end. God is eternal. And his love is always present. <laughs> He wants us to serve Him, to be in fellowship with Him. He wants us to have the forgiveness of our sins. That's what the Lord wants for us. He wants to give us a home in eternity. We have to respond to that love. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, let's read verses 5 through 8 and see the extent to which God loves us. Romans 5 verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see how that he loved us so much that he sent his son, as John put it in John chapter 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the extent to which he loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him as a sacrifice. He gave him to be tortured and murdered on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. That's the greatness of the love of God. And there's nothing that can stop the love of God. In Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, as he's talking to people who have obeyed the gospel, to those who have been forgiven of their sins, to those who are in a covenant relationship with God, he says this in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we commit ourselves to the Lord, when we do as we talked about before, we forsake our sin, we turn to the Lord, we commit ourselves to Him, we don't look back, the writer here is telling us there's nothing that can take away God's love and God's favor from us. Now, we can forsake it. We can abandon it. We can turn our back on God, yes. But any power outside of us cannot rob us of that relationship, cannot break that relationship if we are committed to the Lord. So the love of God will never end. The law of God will never end. Remember 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 23 here. 1 Peter 2, verse 23, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So this gospel that we have, that we have written down for us, is going to last forever. The word of God lives and abides forever. And it is unchangeable. As Jude verse 3 talks about, once for all delivered to the saints. We do not have revisions to the word of God. There is no one coming along these days legitimately changing the Word of God. What was revealed about 2,000 years ago is what we have now. Because it's truth, and truth does not change. So we have the unchangeable, reliable, constant Word of God to which we can turn to know how to be pleasing to God, to know how to receive the love of God that has been expressed through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is that Word that is going to be before us in the day of judgment, as Jesus said in John chapter 12, John 12, verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. See, that word that's been revealed will be compared to our life. Have we lived by it? Have we submitted to it? Have we honored it or not? The Word of God is not going to come to an end. And the verdict that God will issue on that day of judgment will never end. Let's go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. And notice how that there are those who are going to enjoy everlasting life. And... By necessity, we understand that means it won't come to an end because it is everlasting or it is eternal life. Notice how it is described in Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure, a pure, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, every tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Heaven is a place where there's no death, there's no sorrow, there's no tears. There's no pain, there's no suffering. But being in the immediate presence of God, we are in a state of perfection and purity, of strength and vitality for all of eternity. If we go to the judgment and the Lord welcomes us into that home, understand that is our permanent home. It will not end. We will be there forever and ever. But on the other side, if we go before God in the day of judgment and our sins stand against us, then the judgment, the verdict that He gives will not end either. That of being eternal death. In Revelation 20, verse 10. Revelation 20, verse 10, He says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 15, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the devil is cast into that lake of fire. And he says, Anyone not found written in the book, that is in the book of life, that book where God keeps a record of those who have come to Him and serve Him, who are faithful to Him, if you're not written in that book, you're going to be cast into that lake of fire with the devil and be there forever and and ever. In Revelation 21, verse 8, he says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part of the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God extends love to us, but we have to receive that love if we go before Him in the day of judgment. And we have sin, we've not accepted that, we've rejected Him, we've rejected His messengers. We're going to experience eternal death. And that verdict will never change. If you will, open up to number 840. 840. Now just as ancient Judah came to an abrupt and violent end, so it shall be for all who rebel against God, for all whose sins are not forgiven. But you can avoid suffering His wrath by submitting to His will. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you're one who has not submitted to God's will and what it is to become a child of God, what He says and commands to have your sins forgiven, then won't you do that today? The Lord very plainly tells us that we must believe if we are going to be forgiven of our sins, we have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we do not, John 8, 24 says, we will die in our sins. We have to repent of our sins. That is the idea of putting them away, of turning away from them, changing our mind. We're not going to live that way anymore. We're going to live for the Lord. So we have to repent of our sins, Acts 2, 38, to be forgiven of those sins. We have to confess Jesus is the Christ. Jesus said... Mark, or rather Matthew chapter 10, that if we will confess Him before men, He will confess us before the angels of God in heaven. But if we don't confess Him before men, He will not confess us before the Father. And what that means is we're going to lose our souls. So we have to believe, we have to repent, we have to confess. And again, Acts 2.38 tells us we have to be baptized. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. We do that. We will have our sins forgiven. We will be in fellowship with Him. And we can avoid His wrath as we live faithfully for Him, not looking back. If you're a child of God who has turned away from the Lord, then today you need to draw near to Him. We all need to draw near to Him. But if you've been living in sin, you've left things undone in your life, you need to forsake that sin today. Humble yourself before God. Seek His mercy. Pray to Him. Ask for His forgiveness, and He will extend that to you because He loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you. 
He wants you to leave that, the pain, the suffering that comes with the sin, the guilt, and come to Him. Be forgiven. Be restored. And so if you need to do that, we encourage you to do that today. Submission to the Lord will lead to a peaceful end. An end that will surely come. So if you need to respond this morning, whoever you may be, we ask you to come forward while we stand and sing.